This is from more of a management perspective because I'm not uh, I'm totally hands-on with FME, so keep that in mind. Hopefully everyone will get something out of the presentation, but we'll uh, take it a step at a time. Uh, we, uh, we have a sort of a, a virtual environment for the Community Mapping Network, but I'll get that into that a little bit later. There's no real office. It's situated all over the country. The overview of the presentation is I'll just give a few acknowledgments about uh, FME and a few other things and uh, talk about the, a bit about the Community Mapping Network. Uh, what is the uh, Yukon Hydrological Network? How the network was built and the FME experience and the Yukon Watershed Atlas in action. So if we get a chance, I can get online and show you the hydrology for the Yukon and uh, talk about uh, next steps with our uh, project. So first of all, I, I, uh, I've been asked a few times about why I love FME. Well, I'd rather like come out and write and say it. Uh, there's three things. The great support that uh, folks there at FME provided in this project. I, I haven't found any better support. Uh, secondly, this was a cost-effective way to get this job done. We could never have done it without FME. So, and this, I'm a, the Community Mapping Network right now is a nonprofit. So we don't have a huge budget. We would never have gotten this uh, project done without partners and FME. It worked. And the last, the third thing is that the solution actually worked. This, we have a, a hydrology network done for the entire Yukon Territory. Uh, and I'll show you what I'm talking about in a minute, but it actually was a success. A success. Uh, so the funders were uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, L Louise Naylor in the Whitehorse office in the Yukon. NR Can was instrumental. This is uh, Natural Resources Canada uh, back in Eastern Canada, a fellow by the name of Denis Bouton. He helped us with a lot of the FME transformations and uh, was instrumental. And then George Eady and Jackie Woodruff, two contractors that helped us out. So, Rob, why don't you talk about what the Community Mapping Network is? Okay, I'm going to try and define. Um, you've heard already that it's a not-for-profit. Uh, Brad and I are basically the founders, directors, managers. Uh, we can pretty much choose any title we want at this point. It's funny, if you call yourself a director, you get headhunters on LinkedIn thinking you really are a director. <laughs> Um, we have some advisors. We used to have an advisory committee. Now it's kind of ad hoc. A lot of friends in agencies and other companies. So uh, we need advice about how to proceed. We, there's a great community of advisors out there. We started in 2000 with uh, web mapping, which was probably one of the first ones out on the interweb. Um, I, was it Argus Map at Argus that point? Map. Then it morphed into Autodesk. Yeah. Then it morphed into... Um, MapGuide open source, which we're currently using. So 14 years later, uh, we've got about 60 apps or custom web mapping applications for a variety of groups. This is a short list. Uh, our current hardware software combination are these mix of SQL Server for the backside data, MapGuide open source, um, a new thing called GoMap, which is a front end, a little more GIS focused for more advanced users, and the glue, the PHP scripting that's done between the SQL database and MapGuide open source is done through a really powerful scripting app called PHP Runner. All very affordable for not-for-profits. But really, all these atlases and the web apps, it's, they're tools for the true community of local governments, community groups, stream stewards, communities of interest that we attempt to serve. And it's, it's about data for the commons, which is the sensitive habitats, the species information, the things that aren't necessarily readily available or no one's ever bothered to look at, or at least publish it if they do have the data. And it's about credible maps, because as a community group, if you get into engagement with your local government or your province, you have to be credible. And if you walk in with something off the kitchen table, they just don't 
pay as much attention to you. So this is the basic tenet of community-based mapping, which we've tried to put into a web context. This is what you see on the home page. It's uh, kind of fun to play around with. A few introductory videos, uh, a few feature atlases scrolling, a bit of history. And to mention the history, back in the bad old days of the 1990s, like everyone else has said, there were data silos everywhere. So if you were in BC or almost anywhere else and you wanted to, you couldn't find natural resource data. It was either hidden away, let alone view it just rather than get, start again. It was even hard to just view the data, let alone get access to use it. So that's what we focused on. We set out to make a change by doing it ourselves because we couldn't confuse, convince our employers that it was a good idea. Eventually they got on board. Everybody has web map services now. And at the same time, we started getting community groups to start doing detailed mapping of streams. And we pushed that out on the web in the context of the coarser data sets that we could get from provinces and local governments. And that was our beginning. We started out as a different domain name. And if you've ever played around with a thing called the Wayback Machine, it's actually called the archive.org. You can see a history of 2000 up to current day with uh, the very coarse websites, not unlike FME had or SAFE had in the beginning to what we have today. And that's kind of a context of our history and what we're trying to do. Okay. So we'll get into the project now, the uh, Yukon Hydrology Project Area. If anyone's not familiar with uh, where the Yukon is, it's way up. Uh, to the north of BC, just east of Alaska. And it's a big area. There's uh, 186,000 square miles, about 35,000 people, and 264,000 rivers that we have mapped at 1 to 50,000, and 215,000 lakes. And you can go to the atlas to look at it at that URL at the bottom there. So it's a it's a place you, actually it's a solution to the zombie problem. This was my joke, I don't know. <laughs> they're not gonna make it up there, okay? Either they're gonna get their blood sucked out of them on the way or they're gonna freeze to death so there's got no biting left in them. So that was the only thing <laughs> to follow up on the zombie theme. So what is the hydro hydrological network? It's kind of hard to say. <clears throat> it's a GIS based uh, watershed atlas similar to the the BC 1 to 50K watershed atlas, which was built quite a few years ago, over, over a decade and a half ago. Uh, I won't go into it too much, but it, it's all topologically correct. It's got all hierar hierarchical watershed codes. It's all meant to be networked and used for analysis. Uh, the main purpose we found for, and, and use it for is fish and fish habitat management. As you know, we have a huge sockeye salmon run coming this year, but uh, there's some up there in the Yukon as well, and a lot of Chinook and other fish and uh, other resources that depend on water. Uh, the, it can also be used for modeling with climate change and other things, so that's a very important function. Uh, it connects streams to its tributaries and lakes from headwaters to the sea. So, this network is really critically important to join all the tributaries to the main stem through the lakes, and we're talking lots of lakes here, all the way to the ocean. And it uses, again, a hierarchical watershed code system. So it was uh, basically built on uh, the National Hydrographic Network. That's been built out of, um, I guess it's Sherbrooke, uh, back east, and they've tried to create a one to fifty thousand base uh, for the entire for all of Canada. But they use the best, or they use base maps from each prov uh, province and, and network it all together. So uh, it's supposed to provide a quality geometric description and a set of basic attributes describing Canada's inland surface waters. It's initiated back in two thousand and two. <clears throat> they, so they do a lot of the map, they do 
the, Nash, the nation's uh, mapping back east and they add what they call NIDs, national identifiers, to all features on the hydrology. And they take it to a certain level of completion. Uh, there's three levels of completion, CL1, CL2, and CL3. But we had the final, the final version of the data before we worked on it to create the actual network. You can go to geobase.ca to see, their, uh, see the network and all the data. You can download it. It's all freely available. Uh, it's a network of linear flows. They, they validate flow direction. That's what they say for CL3, but we, uh, we found lots of errors there, and I'll get into that in a minute. That's where FME came in. And water body definitions, feature coding, uh, and geographical names. So there's a couple of thousand names of rivers and about the same for lakes in the Yukon. But they're changing, and it's a bit of a moving target at the moment. So the CL3 level of the data is where we got it from uh, NRCAN. Uh, it provides a basic stream network. Its, it's uh, stream segments are topologically correct and connected end to end. Stream direction is mostly correct. It's not all correct, it's mostly correct. <laughs> so this is their definition of what a CL3 product is, what you download from the web. So this is, this is actually, we got it ahead of the curve a little bit for the rest of the provinces if, they, if they we're going to do what we did and what BC did with their Atlas project. Uh, the most important thing to note about uh, the CL3 level of data that we received is that it's not possible to build a full stream network with the raw national hydro network at the CL3 level because the stream segments do not have an identifier which would indicate which segments are part of the same stream. So even though each feature in the hydrology has an NID or an identifier, you can't connect them to make a route to a main stem of each river. So that's where we had to take the CL3 level data from NRCAN to the next level, and that's where FME came in. And this is important because fish swim up and down the stream. Yeah, we want to make sure when the fish uh, migrate, they go up, and when they, the young ones come down, they go down. And everything's connected, and they're not, they're not going the wrong way over mountains or whatever. They have to flow with the gravity. So uh, the input data was, as I say, the NHN. Uh, from Geobase, uh, there were three main topological errors that we found in the CL3 data. And uh, I'm not sure if you can see it very well. Uh, in this first error, there, there are four coincident edges. So we can't have uh, two tributaries coming into the main stem at the same place. We have to move one of the tributaries at least one meter up or down along the, the main stem. So that was, I guess it's not really an error, but it won't work with modeling. We have to move that, we, ha we can't have four uh, coincident edges. So that's where FME came in. And inconsistent directionality. So even though in a CL3 level, they said that uh, they had the flow all correct, they didn't. So uh, that had to be fixed. And the other major problem we had, there were gaps in the network. So again, even though that was uh, in their definition of what CL3 product was, was uh, fixed and, and made available, there were gaps. So, so that's, uh, that's where we came in with FME. And the folks back east actually took it upon themselves to fix a lot of these errors for us using FME. And there were 36. Uh, transformers, and I'm not going to I'm not going to go into each one of them, but uh, I'll, own, I'll I'm basically going to go into one because it's uh, it's not that simple to talk about. I mean, if you if I was to bring up the workbench, you'd see you'd see everything going in every direction, and I'm not going to talk about it. But there's the chopper, the geometry remover, the coordinate rounder, for example, reprojector. Hull replacer, and I'm not sure what that one is, but, <laughs> but
But there were a lot. There were 36 altogether. But the most important one that we were looking at uh, was the stream order calculator. So once all those errors were fixed, all those errors that I mentioned earlier were fixed, then we could start to do the networking uh, using this stream order calculator. And the stream order calculator basically used something called Horton order. It created a Horton order. So for the main stem, uh, the main stem through the middle here, it was given the highest number, number four. And then the branches were a lower number, but each, each section or each uh, segment of the river had a, a number. And uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it was that that formed the basis of creating a unique ID for each river in the Yukon. So the, the Horton order assigns the smallest number to the highest tributaries and the largest number to the main stem of the network. The main stem is the named stream. So the main stem, uh, that was the next thing is what is the main stem? When you've got rivers, you've got a main river going uh, in a certain watershed and it's branching off, what makes this section the main stem versus this section? Well, if it's got a name, if it's named on each section, that was the main stem. So that was easy. But a lot of cases, we didn't have a name on each section of the river. So we had to let uh, FME find the right path for the longest length of each river. And that would be given a, a unique ID for the main stem. So that was another error. Geographical names were not attached to each segment or they went the wrong way. And in fact, that's one of the major things we've got to fix in the future is we've got to go over these uh, streams and, and make sure that the longest path is indeed the true main stem of the river, and it may not be. More flow may be, more flow may be coming in from this section here, and that may be the main stem. So in BC, they spent years uh, going over which was the main stem. And uh, they had lots of, lots of support from all sorts of people to give input about you know, what was what. In our case, we've had to depend on the computer. And uh, <laughs> in most cases, it's the main stem, the longest length that we took. So we're going to be, over the next few years, we're going to be finding errors and trying to fix them. So the next, uh, once we networked, once it was networked, uh, two minutes ago, we had to use ARC, AM, ARC uh, AMLs, and that, they were basically modified from the BC project. And we used them to create, uh, to basically check the network and create true routes and to create hierarchical watershed codes. So a main stem was given a, a parent code, in this case 800, and then each branch was given another uh, code based on the distance up from the mouth. So it's a percentage distance up from the mouth. In, in this case, this branch, or this branch here, is 34.5678% up, up, uh, up the river. So the final products uh, from, were uh, a geodatabase. And we converted that into an SDF file, and we put it onto the web on an atlas on the community mapping network. And you can go online and see it uh, if you go to cmnbc.ca. Uh, you can zoom in, search for a river, click on a river, and the entire river will light up from the mouth to the headwaters. In our uh, atlas product, we can uh, log in. So if, if you've been trained, you can log in the username and password, put a point on the map, and add fish and fish habitat data for the Yukon. And that's been very helpful for them. They've been using it. And the other thing is just finding the rivers. Now we, can, we have a tool here that we can search for any river name. It'll zoom to it, bring it right up. And it's, it's all clean. It's all connected. And it's intelligent. <laughs> so the next steps 
we need to copy the watershed codes to all point data. So on that previous map, you saw a lot of points. Those are just floating in space right now. We'll have to give them a watershed code to connect them to the river they belong on. And uh, create dynamic segments for point data, create watershed boundaries, fix stream and lake names and routes, and need to learn a little bit more about FME, do some more learnings. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Brad and Rob. So now we have time for just a few questions. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand and I'll pass you the mic. Are you feeding any errors you're finding back to the folks at Sherbrooke? Yes. They're a little slow to respond, like <laughs> AT&T and Verizon. I think they, uh, they're looking at the whole country. So uh, we're, gonna, we're feeding back errors and there's errors in their geographic names. There's errors in where things are connecting. So yeah, there's gonna be lots of little errors we've gotta fix. But having said that, it sure is a lot better than what it was now for finding place names and, and knowing, getting an idea of where the flows are going. So it's, uh, it's a long time coming for the Yukon. Right. Maybe related, I yeah, I'm not sure. 112? Yeah. Room 112? 112, Great. <laughs> um, in those places where you found inconsistent directionality, did you find that that was typically in areas where the digital elevation model would be maybe flatter in terrain relief, or would you actually get it in high relief areas as well? Yeah, we didn't, we didn't check the digital yeah. elevation model, but that's a really good point. In BC, I think they actually used that to help them determine which way flows were occurring. So, no, we didn't do it. Uh, we apparently flipped all the flow one way and then flipped it all back the other way, and that made it all consistent. Okay. But that's a really good point. No, we didn't, uh, didn't look at the DEM. That's all the time we have. Thank you very much, Brad.